Hi, I'm Kathy Monholland, uh, Literacy Coordinator at the Tahlequah Public Library. And today I'm doing kind of a special review on this book, which is entitled Until We Meet Again, A True Story of Love and Survival in the Holocaust. Uh, the authors are Michael Korenblit and Kathy Janger. Originally published in 1995, this book uh, will be available to anyone interested in it. Uh, we do have it here at the Tahlequah Library, so if you're, the library in your town doesn't have it, you can always request it from the Tahlequah Public Library. This review is kind of a special review. It's intended to supplement and perhaps to let some of you know that on uh, this coming Wednesday, January 27th, Michael Korenblit himself will do a presentation that will be featured at the end of this video. We'll tell you how to access the presentation that the author is going to do. This text, as mentioned, was written by Michael Kornblit and Kathy Janger. The book itself contains a selection of photos, many of them taken by Michael Kornblit back in 1980 and 1981 when he and his parents went back to some of the um, places that are mentioned in the textbook. It also includes a brief list of sources and an index. This is by no means an academic text. Rather, um, it's just a few, they list a few of the sources that they utilized during the writing of the text. To kind of give a little bit of explanation as to what brought this book about, Kornblit states in his introduction that his lack of extended family haunted him throughout his early years. All the other kids at school, I guess, had very large families are certainly bigger than what he had. Uh, this lack of family and his parents' story uh, led to his interest in their story and in learning about the Holocaust. His wife, Joan, felt the author should write a book, but he worried how his parents would react to being questioned about their experiences in the Holocaust. And to be honest with you, I've known several Holocaust survivors myself and it's always a delicate subject um, to broach with a survivor. So he was worried about how his parents would react. But finally, at the age of 29, his curiosity got the better of him. And when he did ask, his parents heaved sighs of relief that he was finally asking because they thought that he simply wasn't interested when he thought they'd be upset reliving their experiences. But, however, for the next two years, from 1980 to 1981, Hornblit did ask thousands of questions, and the result of those questions and the answers he received are obviously included in the text. Michael Kornblit begins his family's story in their hometown of Hrubieshov, Poland, uh, begins in October 1942, and at that time, 8,000 Jews lived in Hrubieshov. And by the way, for anyone interested, there are dictionaries online that can pronounce words for you. I happened to find a Polish audio dictionary that pronounced the name of the city so I'm doing my best to actually pronounce the name of the city as the Poles would pronounce it. 1942 was a dangerous time in Poland for Jews as the Nazis had already begun rounding them up and deporting them to concentration camps. Jews in Poland at this time had three potential courses of action. They could stay where they were and hope for the best. They could emigrate to Palestine if they had the money and the connections to get passage on boats. And by Palestine, we mean the future Israel, of course. Or they could go to Russia, but the Kornblitz, two oldest sons, had gone to Russia. One of them, they were forced to join the Russian army after the war started. One of their sons was killed during the war and the other son survived and went to Israel. And the third option, they could build or find hiding places for themselves and their families 
until the danger dissipated. Unfortunately, in this case, most of the Kornblitz's family had waited too late. Many Gentiles among the Poles were only too happy to turn in their Jewish neighbors for the German bounty of a pound of sugar for each Jew turned in. This was a time of severe food shortages, and so any Poles that turned in a Jewish neighbor and got this pound of sugar, if they turned in 10 Jews and got 10 pounds of sugar, they could keep some of it for themselves, of course, and then barter or trade with other people for other supplies and foodstuffs that they needed. Conversely, however, many non-Jewish Poles had already helped the Kornblitzes survive to this point. And another neighbor, Gentile farmer Josef Wisniewski, had agreed to hide Avram and Malka Kornblit. This is um, the main subject of the book, is their son Meyer. And so Avram and Malka are Meyer's parents. So he had agreed to hide the parents and their children on his farm. Meyer is, at this point, he is the oldest child with them. He's 17 at the time the book begins. And then the other children, his brothers and sisters, are much younger. With the Kornblitz in hiding, the Nazis' last roundup of Jews in Hrubyeshov occurred on October 28th. 1942. But the Kornblitzes remained safe for many days, living in a, quote, house of hay. This is a large haystack that hid a dugout living space beneath it with a long tunnel entrance hidden by a big bale of hay. Ultimately, however, after so many days in darkness and boredom, Meyer Kornblit, the family's 17-year-old son, and at this point he's the only son they think they've got left, leaves the haystack when a friend tells him that the Gestapo is no longer killing Jews but needs them for work details, digging up vegetables or sorting and shipping all personal and household items from the homes of Jews that had already been deported. Meyer persuades Manya and Heim Nagelstein. I'm sure that's incorrect, but I could not find a Polish dictionary to tell me how to pronounce surnames, so I apologize if that is incorrect. Uh, Manya was Meyer's girlfriend. They had been in love forever, and Heim is her younger brother. They had chosen to go into hiding with the Kornblitzes, and so Meyer, because they were living in the haystack with Meyer and his family, he was able to persuade them to join him in working in the ghetto. Sadly, on one of their scavenging expeditions, Manya was led to her own family home. Her family had, her father was a bricklayer, and he had very carefully and surreptitiously built what he hoped was a hidden room in their family's basement, in the basement of the family home. And once the Nazis began rounding up the Jews, the entire family went into hiding in this hidden room until Meyer came to see them and Manya decided she wanted to go with Meyer. Her mother actually encouraged her to do that, saying, if you do this, maybe one of the family members will survive. And as it turns out, Manya decides to leave with Meyer and all of a sudden her little brother Heim wants to go with them. So eventually two family members survived rather than just one. Uh, but at any rate, she finds herself having to go in to her own family home and she's very apprehensive about doing it. But she does go in and she discovers that the hidden room that her father had secretly constructed over many, many days in the basement had been torn open, bricks everywhere. A few pitiful belongings were still scattered about and the inhabitants, her family, uh, had disappeared. Much later in the book, we find out that her family had been rounded up relatively soon after they had gone into hiding. They were taken to some foxholes that had been dug on the outskirts of the town, shot, and then all of them buried in these foxholes. Meyer, Manya, and Heim, during the process of working in the ghetto, hit upon a scheme they thought would help them 
actually end up escaping the ghetto. So what they decided they would do would be to pilfer small items from the houses that they were cleaning out. And these pilfered items, one of which was a very small ceramic box that Manya describes as, she thinks it's a little jewelry box. Uh, they also took bedding items that had been left, dishes, small dishes, cups and saucers, nothing big. And at one point, Meyer, I think, discovers a velvet quilt that he's only too happy to find. And what they've decided to do with these items is uh, they involve a Gentile friend of theirs. Her name is Anna. They give them to her to sell. They agree to share half of the money that they get for each item. They'll give half of it to Anna, share the money with her, and thus finance their own and their two housemates' flight to freedom. What they don't count on, however, is Anna being an informer. Anna is someone that uh, they had known, Meyer and his family had known for years. They were good friends with them. Anna's husband had disappeared immediately after the war began, and she could only assume that he had been killed. And so what Anna does is she turns Meyer into the Gestapo. When the Gestapo comes looking for him, he decides he is forced to flee. He decides to flee alone from the ghetto. Of course, Manya, who's in love with Meyer, is very upset at this turn of events, but nonetheless, if he's going to survive, he has to flee. He hides for several days with another Gentile friend before setting out for a nearby village to try to find his family. And so while Meyer, Manya, and Haim are in the ghetto, uh, Avram and Malka have decided to leave and move to go to another small town not too far from the haystack. Life in the haystack was dark, very boring. They could not tell the passage of time, so they got all mixed up in their sleeping habits. They ended up sleeping most of the day uh, into the late afternoon. Then they would wake up, and Yosef, the farmer, after it got dark, would bring them food. Then they would have to sneak out of this tunnel and try to find the food where he had left it. So everybody was bored, confused by the darkness and the boredom. Meyer eventually arrives at the village. He has to travel at night, of course. And from two Gentile friends who are taking care of his father's flour mill, he learns that his family is there and they are safe. Through these two Gentile friends, Meyer acquires new identity papers showing him to be a non-Jewish Pole, which is very important because these papers permit him to do sort of traveling as a non-Jewish Pole. For most of the spring and summer of 1943, Meyer spends it away from Manya and Haim and Rubyeshov and his family. He moves around Poland on trains, staying in a town only three or four nights, sometimes not even that, before getting on another train and going on to another town before eventually cycling back to his hometown. And Manya, he cannot leave her. So Meyer is indeed a wandering Jew. With Meyer in hiding and Manya spending every second with him when he is in Hrubyeshov, her younger brother Haim falls into a deep depression. Part of the depression stems from his jealousy of Meyer. He loves Meyer, but he's uh, very jealous of the time Meyer spends with his sister. But Haim is also worried about his missing family. Uh, every Jew in every country of Europe that Jews lived in, they all worried about their missing families. Probably by this time they knew about the camps, not sure what they knew about the extent of the atrocities that were going on there, but they certainly did know if they had been deported that that was definitely a very bad thing. So Haim, suffering from this deep depression, finally breaks. Nazis had finally begun to deport Jews who were clearing out houses in Hrubyeshov because it's a small village, really, and 
they're not going to be kept busy clearing out these houses for 12 years. So the Nazis have already started deporting uh, his friends in the village. When he refuses to hide from the Nazis, ultimately this is how he was captured. He refuses to go into hiding when the trucks that the Nazis used to gather up these people showed up in Rubyashov. He is unswayed by Manya's begging and pleading to hide from the trucks used to deport Jews. And Haim allows himself to be loaded up onto a de deportation truck headed who knows where. The next calamity to befall Meyer is the death of his father, Avram, in a different town from the one he thought his parent was in. Avram is leaving his wife and daughters in hiding. Avram goes out into this neighboring village and wants to find out what's going on. He is spotted, denounced as a Jew, attacked, and hit in the head with a steel bar. Subsequently, he falls into a deep coma and dies in a ghetto hospital four days after his fatal attack. Meyer, who is looking for Avram, hears the story of a Jewish man being attacked in the street, goes to the hospital, and finds his father. So, for three days, he sits with his father and holds his hand, talks to him about the family, hoping that this will pull Avram out of this coma. Unfortunately, nothing happens, and on the fourth morning of being in this ghetto hospital, his father dies. Meyer also, of course, is hoping that he can find out what has happened to his mother and sisters. He does not find out from Avram what's happened to his family. Later, he found out from Franiak Gorski, chief of police in Rubyeshov at that time, that Meyer's mother and her three daughters had left their hiding place when Avram did not come back. Malka, the mother, assumed the worst, and she decided to take her children, leave hiding, they boarded a train. While on the train, they were recognized and denounced as Jews and were shot and killed by the Germans. After he learns that his mother and sisters are dead, he realizes that all of his family members are dead. Throughout their ordeal, Meyer and Manya had been helped not only by Gorski, chief of police, but also by John Salky, who is commissioner of roads in Hubyeshov. When one of his friends asked Meyer, one of Meyer's former housemates, to help him get false ID papers because Leon, the young man who asks Meyer for help getting false ID papers, Meyer agrees and he sends him to Salky. Tragically, the SS finds out about this, and they go to Salky's home. They shoot him dead outside his home in front of his wife and children, and the two Jews that Meyer had sent to Salky for help were also discovered and murdered. Ultimately, the worst fate, in spite of all the traveling around and the hiding out that Manya's doing, and Meyer as well, they are discovered, they are deported to the work camp called Budzin in Poland, which is near the city of Krasnik. Later, both were transferred. Uh, Manya and Meyer are both initially sent to Mielek, Mielex, and later Maya, Manya is sent to Plazow, where Amon Goth and Oscar Schindler were located. If you've seen Schindler's list, then you know that Ammon Goth was um, in charge of the camp there. Uh, Meyer, as I mentioned, also went to Mielix, and both camps were in Poland. Generally, the Nazis set up death camps in Poland. Work camps were set up in Germany. They set up the death camps in Poland because if they lost the war, they did not want any of these death camps to be in Poland, uh, in Germany, sorry, for obvious reasons. On their arrival at their first camp, Budson, Manya asks Meyer, where are we? He morosely answers, 
in hell. Before the end of the war, Meyer and Manya are separated and separately moved by the Nazis numerous times. They are sent to camps and subcamps, two in Czechoslovakia, like Meritz and Lichtenverden in, again, Czechoslovakia, Matthausen in Austria, Dachau, and that is how the Poles pronounce Dachau, and its satellite camp Kaufering in Germany, and the worst of all, Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland. I'm going to stop my review here and hope that I've whetted your appetite for the end of the story because there's much more story to be told. Obviously, Meyer and Manya survived the war since their son, Michael, is the author of this book. To hear the end of the story, please plan to join the Eastern Oklahoma Library Systems program featuring a presentation on this book by the author Michael Kornblitz. This presentation is intended to honor International Holocaust Remembrance Day this year on January 27th. The presentation may be intended to honor the book and the Remembrance Day, but I think it will also honor the resiliency, courage, and bravery of two extraordinary people, Meyer and Manya Kornblitz. Thank you for listening. And there will be uh, instructions at the end of this to tell you how to access being able to watch the presentation. So thank you all very much. And read the book.